Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Gordon Current Science and Technology stage. My name is Corrine, and our topic today is energy. It's something we all know it's important, it's everywhere around us, keeps your house warm, your fridge cold, keeps your car running. But where do we actually get all this energy? Is it possible we're going to run out of some of our important sources of energy? And how can science and engineering help us secure a clean, safe, reliable supply of energy for our future? Those are the questions I'm going to try to answer for you today, and hopefully we'll have a little fun along the way. So to begin, let's think about what is energy? It's a little bit hard to define because you can't really grab it and hold it in your hand. But one way that scientists define energy is they say it's a force, which is a push or a pull, multiplied by some distance or movement through space. Now, if I use that definition, when I blow up this latex balloon, the latex is being pushed through space. So I'm actually adding energy to this balloon. The balloon now acts like a battery. It's storing energy that I've added to it. So I could release that energy all at once if I popped it with a pin. I could release the energy a little bit more slowly, producing sound, which is a form of energy, or release it more quickly, producing motion, which is another form of energy. And there are many forms of energy, heat, light, electricity. They're all different forms of energy. And one of the most important ideas in science is that you can't create or destroy energy. You can only change it or transfer it from one form to another. For example, our bodies use energy all the time to do things like run to get somewhere. Now, the energy that my body uses for motion, some of that gets converted into heat. That's why when you exercise, your body warms up. Now, where do our bodies get energy we need to do things? Excellent. I have an example of that right here with my fruit clock. The energy in food can even be converted into electricity to run this clock. Pretty cool, right? Now, what about the energy inside food? Where does all of that come from? The sun. The sun. Excellent. In fact, almost all the energy on Earth originally comes from the sun. It's just been stored and transferred a lot of different ways. Plants are really good at storing that sun's energy through a process called photosynthesis. And animals can't get energy directly from the sun, so they'll come and eat these plants for energy. And other animals will come along and eat those animals for energy, like when you have a hamburger. Your body and your mind runs on energy that originally comes from the sun. Now, what about energy outside of our bodies? Where does all of that come from? This graph shows you energy use in the United States in the last year. The biggest piece, most of our uh, energy, is petroleum. We use that gas in your car, diesel fuel in your trucks. It's for transportation. The next piece, natural gas, you probably use that in your home for heating and cooking. The orange piece, coal, we use that in our power plants to generate electricity. And same with the blue and the green pieces, uh, nuclear and renewables. We generally use those to generate electricity as well. And looking at this breakdown of sources, most of our energy, those three biggest pieces, are something that we call fossil fuels. All the material in fossil fuels was once living plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. And those plants and animals stored energy from the sun in carbon compounds, and then those plants and animals got trapped under layers of sand and earth and ocean, and over long periods of time they were compressed and they turned into the oil, coal, and natural gas that we pump out of the ground and use for energy today. So fossil fuel energy also originally comes from the sun. Now, this system has worked really well for us. We have gotten a lot of energy from fossil fuels, but we're starting to realize there are some problems with relying on fossil fuels as our main energy source. One problem is it's a one-way system. Once you burn fossil fuels, they're gone. They took hundreds of thousands of years to form, so they're not coming back anytime soon, and that's a pretty big problem. Another issue is that when we burn fossil fuels, the carbon compounds combine with oxygen in our atmosphere to form carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. Now, you've probably heard that word in the news, and you may or may not know why it's called greenhouse gases. But these gases do the same thing that glass does in the roof of a greenhouse. It lets the sun's light in, but it traps some of that heat, keeping the greenhouse nice and warm. Now, those gases do exactly that in our atmosphere. They let the sun's light in, and they trap some of that heat, keeping the Earth nice and warm. Now, that's a really good thing for Earth. It keeps 
earth warm enough for liquid water and life, but too much of a good thing is where we're running into problems. And the more and more greenhouse gases we put in our atmosphere, the more and more heat is being trapped. And that's slowly warming our planet. So there are a lot of consequences, actually, to having a warmer planet. One is we lose habitat in our polar regions. Another consequence, more severe weather events like hurricanes and droughts. But probably the most dangerous consequence is the melting of ice. A lot of Earth's water is trapped in huge ice sheets that are in Greenland and in Antarctica. And as the planet warms, that ice melts and it flows into the sea and it raises the level of the sea. Now scientists think if all that ice were to melt, it would raise sea levels by something like 100 feet. Now that's going to put all our coastal cities underwater, and obviously we don't want to end up in that situation. So these consequences are some of the reasons that scientists all over the world are researching renewable energy technologies, like solar power, wind power, and biofuels. But one problem is that not one of these technologies has proven capable of producing enough energy at a low enough cost to replace fossil fuels. So we need some other solutions. And that's where nanotechnology comes in. Nanotechnology is, is a relatively new field of science. And what it is is science at the nanoscale. The scale of individual atoms and molecules, which are the building blocks of everything in the universe. We've known about atoms and molecules for a really long time, but we couldn't actually do much with them. We couldn't manipulate matter at that tiny, tiny scale. But that's starting to change. And recently, scientists have made huge advances working at the nanoscale, working with the individual atoms and molecules that our renewable energy technologies are made of. And it's making them better, more efficient, able to produce more energy. Now, there are a lot of applications for nanotechnology in energy. I'm just going to focus on three for you today. The first is, how can nanotechnology help us harness and gather all the energy that we need? Second, once we have that energy, how can it help us better distribute it or move that energy around to where we need to use it? And finally, how can it help us use energy in a little bit better, more efficient way? I'm going to test your memory. Where did I say most of the energy on Earth originally comes from? The sun. In fact, more energy comes from the sun to the Earth than humans could ever possibly use. If you took all the energy that you use and every human on Earth uses for an entire year, that's the same energy we get in one hour of global sunshine. One hour. That's how much energy is coming from the sun. This map shows you global sunshine. Areas in blue don't get much sun at all. The areas in orange get a lot. And those dots are places where if we could put great big solar farms in those locations, we could produce enough energy for the entire world. That's a big idea with a pretty big hurdle. How do we inexpensively build these enormous solar farms? And that's probably the greatest promise of nanotechnology. You see, a solar panel does something that's really special. It's able to take light energy and convert it into electricity. I have a sample right here, a little solar panel hooked up to a motor and a fan. And when I turn on the light, the light energy can be directly converted into electricity to run that fan. Now, what's so special about this is it does it without creating any waste. Every single other energy system on Earth that we use also creates waste when it makes energy. Even your bodies create waste when you generate energy from the food that you eat. Burning fossil fuels produces tons of waste. Even nuclear and biofuels produce waste. But there is no waste coming out of that solar cell, none at all. And that is such a special benefit. So you might wonder, why hasn't solar energy taken off in the United States? Does anybody here in our audience have solar panels on their roof at home? Excellent. They're still pretty rare, though. When you walk around most neighborhoods, you don't see them on every home. And that's because there are some problems with traditional solar panel technology. And it has to do with how they're made and installed. They are just very expensive. If you're going to put solar panels on the average size home, you need about four kilowatts of those solar panels. That's going to run you more than $20,000. Now, that cost discourages people. The reason they're so expensive has to do with how a traditional solar panel is made. It is a sandwich of two thick layers of semiconducting silicon. And the silicon material is actually pretty expensive. You also need a lot of heat and energy when you actually fabricate the cell. 
that also costs a lot of money. And lastly, silicon is brittle, so you need to sandwich it between two thick layers of glass to protect it. Now that's going to make it harder to install, harder to ship, all of that further driving up the cost.